Today's session is on a short introduction to the financial and economic analysis of development projects. It is a webinar of relevance to all those who are working on designing, implementing, and evaluating development projects. We will hear about the difference between cost-benefit analysis and cost-effectiveness analysis, their relevance, appropriate methodology, and particularities of applying them, in particular through a concrete example of its application in the water sector. The objective of this webinar is to give a basic understanding of cost-benefit analysis and cost-effectiveness analysis. It's not a training, and it will not enable you to become an expert, but rather at the end of the session, you should be able to see what can be done and where to find more help and resources. With the short introduction to the topic of today, we are now ready to start. Allow me to introduce the people who will be participating in this webinar. Um, we will hear from two presenters, Mr. Pradeep Iti, Head of Quality Assurance and Poverty Reduction at SDC, who will present an overview of the methodology for cost-benefit analysis and cost-effectiveness analysis in the development sector. And this will be followed by a presentation from Dr. Dominique Gena from the Bern University of Applied Sciences. These two experts will then be available to answer all your questions during the second part of the webinar, which will be dedicated to a question and answer session. We also have Andreas Steiner, who led the thematic coordination of this webinar, and Sandra Brunmann, who coordinates the overall Réseau webinar series. Last but not least, we have Martin Lang and Egi Akiol from SCAT and STC, respectively, who are supporting us with the technical um, facilitation of this webinar. And this is the agenda for the webinar. It will last one hour. And we will start with the presentation from uh, Pradeep Iti. Just a quick introduction. Mr. Pradeep Iti is Head of Quality Assurance and Poverty Reduction at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And he holds a doctorate in Agricultural Economics from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Pradeep, if you can hear me, over to you. Okay, thank you very much and um, uh, good afternoon or good morning to everybody. Um, I do hope that uh, in preparation of this webinar that you could have a look at our um, how to do note on financial and economic analysis and um, that you might have also um, had a look at our module on cost-benefit analysis, especially the little videos, I think, are very good to explain in a nutshell what it's all about. Um, but now I will give you a short introduction to this topic. And afterwards, uh, Dominique will be um, giving you an example which illustrates um, what my introduction is about. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis um, is to compare the costs and benefits of projects over time uh, and look at their profitability. Uh, cost um, efficiency, anal effectiveness analysis is done when it's not possible to monetize all the benefits. And this is often the case when we have environmental projects, education projects, and also um, governance and health. And there we would be more comparing the different costs of um, reaching the expected results uh, that we aim at. A cost-benefit analysis is used to determine whether a planned investment or decision can meet the viability criteria that are considered as being sufficient to go ahead. And uh, both these types of analysis are to provide a basis to compare projects when different options are on the table. <clears throat> now, one important distinction, and that's not always uh, trivial, is to look uh, the differences between financial and economic analysis. Um, when you have a cost-benefit analysis from the point of view, for instance, of an entrepreneur, uh, this is a financial analysis, uh, looking at the flows of uh, uh, cash which comes in and out uh, of this enterprise or this entrepreneur. And um, a cost-benefit analysis which looks at the perspective of the society as a whole is called an economic analysis. 
the financial analysis is only concerned with uh, actual real costs and real benefits at market prices, uh, and it takes a, f a private perspective. And it answers the question, is the project financially profitable to one of the parties of concern? And this could be, for instance, a farmer who is investing uh, in, um, let's say, better seeds and better agricultural uh, production techniques. Is it worth for him to um, increase um, certain costs because he is going to be having more benefits at the end of the day? Whereas an economic analysis is concerned with the costs and benefits to the society, and this is regardless of who pays and who gains, uh, therefore having a broader perspective. It is also therefore called social analysis, coming from the uh, term society. An economic analysis um, takes into account direct and indirect effects, and it also includes um, negative and positive externalities. This means, for instance, if I stay with the example in agriculture, um, we are not only looking at what this farmer is having to spend more and what benefits the farmer would be getting from a project, but we would be also considering all the costs which come to, to society as a whole. For instance, if the farmer is using um, uh, artificial fertilizers, um, this might have to be imported by the government from abroad and uh, would be subject to, let's say, uh, taxes. Now, uh, taxes are also a revenue for the government. So in an economic analysis, we would not consider uh, these taxes uh, because it's, uh, it also flows into the um, state uh, treasure. And, uh, but with an economic analysis, we would have to take into account the, uh, what we call is externalities. These are effects which are induced. And if I stay with my example of um, agriculture, if the farmer uh, uses um, uh, pesticides or um, um, artificial um, fertilizers which have adverse environmental effects, these effects would have to be captured in our analysis as well. The damage caused by fertilizers, let's say, on, uh, on birds or on other uh, uh, animals. Now, financial and economic analysis can be conducted for the same intervention, but it shows different uh, aspects uh, because the economic analysis looks at the impact for the society whereas uh, the financial analysis looks at the perspective from one of the actors only. The cost-benefit analysis model is normally set up for a time frame of roughly six to ten years. This is a period which is not necessarily uh, corresponding to the project phase because there are effects uh, and sometimes also costs which happen after the project phase is uh, finished. <clears throat> and we try to compare the project uh, with the intervention as against the a project without the intervention. So there we look at incremental costs versus the incremental benefits which are being generated. And normally a cost benefit or cost uh, effectiveness analysis is applied before a project is implemented. Um, and there we can uh, have some assumptions. And then it is also very useful to conduct this once a project is completed completed to see what was actually uh, realized in terms of benefits and actual uh, real costs which uh, did take place. Um, additional costs and benefits are considered, um, yes, as I said, with and without the project or if that is uh, not uh, always possible um, before and after the project took place to compare the two situations. 
in uh, these types of analysis, there's something which is maybe not always uh, obvious for um, non-economists. We have to discount the different um, uh, values uh, in terms of costs and benefits because uh, the value of one dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Um, and the later a benefit or a cost occurs, the lower will it will be its value today, uh, which is also called present value. <clears throat> that is, uh, if um, a loaf of bread uh, today costs uh, one dollar, um, then um, if we get a loaf of bread 10 years from now, uh, the value of this loaf of bread will be less. <clears throat> and um, this corresponds also to what we can say is the opportunity cost of capital because if I would invest uh, $100 today I could um, get interest out of this um, and this is the in certain cases what we would take as discount rate. Um, the information on discount rate could be provided if you are looking at uh, um, an economic analysis from the society's point of view, you could get this from the central bank of your country or the World Bank. In the case of a private analysis, um, financial analysis, there you would have to look at what is the opportunity cost of the capital from um, the player that you are considering. In the case of my example of the farmer, what would be uh, the alternative uh, that the farmer would receive if he would place this money um, in, I don't know, a local post office savings account or something like that, which would be available to him. The internal rate of return, which is estimated through such an analy analysis, provides a value based on which which one can discuss if it is higher than an assumed discount rate. Uh, so sometimes you might not have an exact value of the discount rate, but through the cost-benefit analysis, you would be able to calculate an internal rate of return, and you could discuss if this is, um, if you consider this as uh, below or above. Uh, uh, discount rate. So in case you are not sure about your discount rate and you get uh, an internal rate of return, let's say of 2%, you might wonder if um, this is realistic to go ahead or if in your particular case the discount rate would be let's say 10% uh, around 10% then you would say clearly this project uh, is inferior to, to, to the rate that you would obtain otherwise. And keep in mind that uh, a challenge with cost benefit and also sometimes with cost uh, effectiveness analysis uh, comes from the difficulty to monetize all the costs and all the benefits. Um, and also the extent of including uh, intangible benefits because sometimes uh, it's not always that easy to um, quantify some of the benefits. There might be other issues which are involved. And here in this little table you see uh, that um, it is uh, more easy to deal with projects um, having income generation, uh, certain livelihood aspects or economic development. It gets more difficult with health. Uh, how do you exactly value, uh, for instance, the numbers of days that a person is not sick and can go to work or in case of, uh, um, of uh, people working at home, uh, what is the value of their being not sick? Uh, these are sometimes more difficult to quantify. Also the quantification of the benefits from education, uh, these could be long term, one is not sure if the person would be using uh, his or her education um, in economic terms um, and also for natural resource management or biodiversity, it's not so easy to quantify the benefits and to put an economic value to these. Then even more difficult comes uh, the cases of governance projects. Um, 
um, gains in human rights or uh, things of that sort or um, institutional development uh, when there are projects also improving the gender equality uh, or equities issues where uh, poor people would be benefiting more than uh, richer people these are more challenging Although they are challenging, it is also possible. And in any case, uh, you would be able to find uh, literature which deals with these uh, more tricky situations. Then um, very good is to conduct sensitivity analysis because this allows you to test uh, the model with different assumptions because uh, you sometimes are not 100% sure uh, about certain figures and you can play around saying, okay, we have guessed approximately that, um, let's say, the farmer will be able to increase his yield by, um, let's say, uh, two tons per hectare, but you are not 100% sure if this is realistic. And so in your sensitivity analysis, you might test what would be the situation if the farmer would only increase his yields by one ton per hectare or by three tons per hectare. And look, how does this influence your result? Then, as part of results-based management, financial and economic considerations are important means to assess uh, the efficiency of development interventions by improving the links between the resources that have been put into the project and the results uh, which uh, come out of this. <clears throat> and uh, this can be very powerful uh, to give arguments why a project would be worth uh, financing. Even if you are not doing uh, an analysis on your whole project, even a basic or partial analysis of one component can be very useful uh, to give some idea of the cost-benefit analysis of the projects. Uh, you might have three or four components in your project and uh, not all of them are easy to quantify and to do a cost-benefit analysis, but you might want to look at certain aspects which already sheds light on uh, parts of your project. Uh, economic or financial analysis is usually complemented by other types of analysis, and it should never be the only criteria uh, to take a decision. The analysis also obliges the project stakeholders to formulate impact hypotheses or theories of change and um, include baselines and think about the benefits of the project and quantify these benefits in monetary terms. Often this leads to very fruitful and interesting discussions among the project partners um, with beneficiaries as well uh, to question some of the assumptions, some of the results uh, and so on. So this is very beneficial also from the point of view of, uh, of the process of uh, um, uh, developing a project. Uh, the analysis also identifies the main parameters which influence the effectiveness of a project and allow simulations by changing project assumptions through these sensitivity analysis. It's also interesting because then you see uh, what are the benefits which have the highest uh, weight in your project. It might not always be what you had uh, first thought of. Um, and there uh, it gives also uh, clues about what um, benefits are worth uh, increasing in case you want to uh, improve the, the benefit side and uh, maybe also see what are the costs which uh, could be reduced to make a big impact. These analyses also contribute to a debate on fundamental values in development cooperation and it adds some hard facts uh, to more qualitative factors. It is also an excellent communication tool uh, to persuade potential partners to upscale or to support a project. And finally, not all development employees must be able to perform a financial and economic analysis by themselves. 
but uh, the basic concepts and methodologies should be understood to be able to assess whether or not financial and economic analysis makes sense, to ask the right questions and uh, get the required answers and mandate financial and economic analysis uh, to specialists, uh, consultants, but then also question some of uh, what they had been uh, uh, putting in in terms of data or assumptions. So this ends my presentation and now uh, Dominique uh, will be able to take over with uh, an illustration of this um, uh, concept. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pradeep, for this uh, really clear uh, presentation and overview uh, of what uh, cost-benefit analysis or cost-effectiveness analysis can, can do. Uh, in development projects, I think I just want to highlight as well one of the uh, resources that you mentioned, which is this uh, how-to note, which was produced by STC, um, is available online, and I've put the link in the chat box. And if some of the concepts that Pradeep uh, talked about are not clear, uh, perhaps you can also refer to this how-to note, um, as well as an online course, which is available, and I will circulate the uh, information about this a bit later during the webinar. And before we move on to Dominique, I also want to highlight that uh, you can feel free to type any questions and any comments in the chat box as we go along. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, most of us here online, I think, are not economists. And uh, if you think perhaps there is something really basic that you didn't understand or you want some uh, explanation of something that you did in a project in particular, feel free to type it in the chat box and we'll get to it during the question and answer session. Exactly. And in case you have any questions on the how to do note or so, also feel free to type these in uh, the, the, the chat box. Great. Thank you, Pradeep. And now I will quickly introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Dominique Gena. He obtained the PhD in Agricultural Economics in ETH Zurich, and he's a professor at the School of Agricultural, Forest and Food Sciences of Bern University of Applied Sciences. He also is still a consultant and does a consultancies and applied research. One of the long-term consultancies that he has done was the backstopping mandate for SDC for the broader application of cost-benefit and cost-effectiveness analysis in development projects. Uh, from 2011 up until 2017. Uh, so this included the elaboration of the famous how-to note, which we have talked about, and an e-learning tool. Uh, Dominique, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good night, depending. I'm very happy to be here with you to present you this example of an application of a cost-benefit, cost-effectiveness analysis in the case of Zimbabwe. As you see it on the title, in the title, it's a hand-washing campaign that's obviously in the wash sector, water, uh, sanitation and, uh, and health. And so it's not a classical project, as it's called a campaign. It means it, it's not something that lasted very long. It had a duration of about uh, one, one and a half years altogether. It was composed of a campaign in uh, urban Harare and then also in the rural area. So these were like punctual interventions over several months and not a classical project that lasts over a longer period of time, which required adapting a little bit the cost-benefit analysis or cost-effectiveness analysis method. So let's briefly go through this. I may not uh, explain everything on each slide because I was told it's maybe a bit too long. So, uh, But let me first introduce the project and the objective of the study. So the, the people from the water sector in Bern asked us to do a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, it was both actually were mentioned, cost-benefit or cost-effectiveness analysis. And so during the elaboration of the study, we had to decide what is more relevant in this specific case. So you will see during the presentation how we came to, our, uh, op to the option that we have chosen. <clears throat> So the objective was to do and uh, to analyze or to go to to check what are commonly used assessment methods 
for projects, for economic assessment of projects in WASH and in health. So then we had to do the economic assessment of this campaign, uh, Zimbabwe Health uh, Hand Washing Campaign. So developing an analytical framework for this specific project and then make recommendations for uh, the global program water of SDC for the further application of the methodology to other projects. This, I will not go into all the details, but this is a theory of change that comes from the project document. And this is an essential part, as Pradeep mentioned before, it's essential to have this theory of change to know what are the connections between the project activities and the expected outcomes and impacts. And this is the way to connect the costs of the project to the benefits. The benefits will be found at the level of outcomes and impacts, whereas the costs will be at the level of inputs and outputs. So this is in, in broad terms uh, what we can say. And in the specific case of the Zimbabwe hand washing campaign, um, what the project did is to sensitize the, 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 the population, the target groups, the target groups being mainly schools and rural communities connected to the schools in Zimbabwe, making them aware of the importance of washing hands and introducing a simple method to improve the hand washing at critical times, critical, critical times being um, after stool and before food. So then this, what the project did is to improve, to, to try to change the behavior of the people, to make it like an automatic behavior to wash hands at those critical times. And what do we expect from that? Of course, we expect first that many people will adopt the, the, the behavior and then that behavior will improve the people's health and the people's lives. So the, the, people the people's health will be improved. With, this is known from the literature that if you clean your hands and you, you will have a reduced risk of having diarrhea, of being sick, and then you will have more days where you will be able to work instead of being sick. So these are the connections that are expected. Now, in the present analysis, we did not want to prove this. There is enough literature to prove that washing hands is useful to reduce cases of diarrhea. So we focused more on the behavior change and adoption of the behavior. So the methodology, how to go about the the analysis, how to do such an analysis. And I must say there is not a standard methodology that can be just blueprinted and applied in, in any case. For each project, you have to think uh, in, in new terms, you have to think about how to apply the methodology and uh, how to make a meaningful uh, costs benefit analysis model or cost effectiveness analysis model. It's not obvious that you will come to a good result if you do not consider a few important things. So it's a systematic stepwise approach and I will briefly explain the steps. So step one, defining the boundaries of the project that is to be analyzed. This was done together with the project stakeholders in Zimbabwe. We discussed with them what, is, what are the boundaries of the units that we want to analyze. And the answer was the school the, the different schools that are targeted by the project and all the people that relate to the schools, that means the families of the school children. So this is the, these are the boundaries. So it's not a political boundary, it's not a, it's not a, a watershed boundary, but it's really the, the, the people that connect to the school. Then step two, what are the impact hypotheses of the hand washing campaign? This relates to the slide before. Then we go to step three, and this is very important, whose costs and whose benefits count? Uh, many times in, when we talk with people from SDC, they think, oh, it's just our costs that are relevant. We should look at the, the, the effectiveness of our money, our funds. But when you do such a project, and that applies, I think, to any project, it's not just the, the costs or the money from SDC that counts, it's also the money that is paid by the local stakeholders. To, to make this hand washing possible in the case of Zimbabwe, 
SDC contributed. They did not really contribute to, ha to hardware, they contrib contributed mostly to software uh, elements. But the water has to be available and then you need to have buckets and all sorts of materials that were, that were paid by different stakeholders, including the schools themselves, partly the families and the, the school children and partly also other contributors, the, including public uh, Zimbabwean public money. And then what data needs to be collected? What, are, what is the important data that you need to do the cost benefit or cost effectiveness analysis? So this had to be carefully analyzed. What data is already available from the monitoring and evaluation of the project? And what additional data would be required to do this? So this is something we had to do and we decided to do an additional data collection. Uh, I will also explain what we collected. And once you have done step four, you can go into calculating the cost per unit for a cost effectiveness analysis or a cost benefit analysis with the indicators internal rate of return net present value as uh, Pradeep explained before. And once you have the model, the CBA or CEA model, step six is very important. It's the interpretation of the result. What does it mean? When you have a figure at the end of the CBA, it's not the end. You have to do what does it mean? What is the what can you do with this? So these it gives a very brief overview of the, the project. So you have two components, the urban and the rural part of the project and for the project, we had direct beneficiaries and indirect beneficiaries. So the direct ones are the, those that are directly connected to the schools or health centers, and the indirect beneficiaries would be family members of those direct beneficiaries. Now, data sources, where do we get data? You see Action Aid. This was the NGO that was implementing the project. You see the logo of SDC here. And then we have questionnaires with using data winners going into an Excel database. This is the part of data that we have collected for this study. So the data on costs, we got data on costs from reports. That's the data that is readily available. There was a research component for this project. And then there was the campaign design and baseline study that were financed and implementation costs, staff overhead, promotion, policy support, etc. And then we had data on costs from the survey. You see on the left side, there are almost no costs that relate to local stakeholders. So this is mainly what we had to collect in addition. What was paid by the locals for uh, hand washing, material and training at the levels of schools, households and health centers. In the cost effectiveness analysis, benefits are measurable outcomes and impacts. Increased knowledge and enhanced capacities, even though many people think, well, these are also impacts. Yes, they are impacts, but they are not measurable as such. And they will become measurable if there is an action that is linked to these increased knowledge and, and, um, and capacities. So we are looking for measurable outcomes and impacts. So the data on benefits from the reports, we, could, we had access to a report which was evaluation of adoption, behavior change, self-reported and observed. This was done by EAVAG, who was the Swiss uh, supporting institution in this project. They were the ones take, who took care of the research part. And then data on benefits from our survey, we did additional data collection on hand washing adoption that, was, uh, that we could compare to the data provided by the EAVAG study. And then we also asked some questions on the incident, on the diarrhea incidents, on school absenteeism, and on policy outcomes um, assessed by the key st stakeholders. So these are some cost effectiveness indicators. And you see, I'm insisting now more on cost effectiveness. I, ha I think I have deleted some of the slides because there were too many. But in, in that part, we explained that uh, looking at the project, we decided that cost-benefit analysis would not make sense because 
it's almost impossible to give a value, to attribute a value to to uh, hand washing as such. What is the value of a child that is pro uh, properly washing his hands before, at critical times? So it's easier to look at the costs and then to calculate costs per unit of outcome. And this is what you see here. Um, this table is divided in three parts. You have before the campaign, during the campaign, and after the campaign. So these were the development costs. That's all the uh, part that was done by Airwag. So they were doing, uh, in a scientific way, they set up this campaign. So this is the green arrow, and then you have the blue arrow. That These are the implementation costs that SDC paid during the campaign, and then the, the purple or the... the yeah, I think purple arrow are the local costs of local stakeholders. And you see these local costs, they do not stop at the end of the campaign. They continue and assuming that this will be sustainable, it will continue for many uh, years. So we have the beneficiaries. We have direct beneficiaries and indirect, as I men mentioned before. And the same applies after the campaign. So we want to know what are, and these are the cost effectiveness indicators, what are the costs per person that could be reached by the project? How much did, you, did we spend or did the project spend per person that was reached with the campaign among the direct and indirect beneficiaries? And then we looked at the costs per behavior changed. So you may have reached people, but they may not have changed the behavior. So you want to know what are the costs per behavior changed. And you will see this has some implications in methodology, how to measure the behavior change. And then we also have costs per case of diarrhea averted, even though I said we only have limited information about the, this impact. And then the costs per day of school absenteeism averted was uh, the last of these cost effectiveness indicators. And then on the far right of this slide, you see local costs per person reached after the campaign. So that would be uh, the costs once the campaign is over. That's the, the daily business and uh, what, what is the cost to maintain this hand washing at the level that we expect. So this is, these are those indicators. Now we come to the way of measuring the adoption and you will see this is something a bit innovative that we developed in the course of this uh, of this um, analysis you see here the hand washing quality frequency index it's the effectiveness ladder and this ladder summarizes the adoption of the hand washing combining frequency and quality this value, quality frequency index, was assessed by the teachers for their learners and by the caregivers for the household members. And you see the maximum, the highest mark would be five where very well, four is washing hands well, or often you see the, the frequency is always and the quality is very well. And then the frequency by four is often and well. And then for three, it's quite often and so-so in quality. And then sometimes and poorly and uh, one would be never and not at all. So how to calculate this? We assume there are, as we said, we have two critical moments. One is related to stool and one is related to food. So if somebody has a five always washing hands properly uh, uh, in quality and in frequency with stool in relation with stool and four and three in relation with food. That would give, give a QF index of five plus four plus five plus three divided by four. That gives 4.25. That's a combination of the quality and frequency of hand washing. So this is something that was developed within this uh, study. Now, what are the results? First, some key figures of the project, and then the costs share by cost category, and then the costs before, during, and after the project. And then we look at the benefits, adoption of hand washing, reduced incidence of diarrhea, and reduced school absenteeism, and then comparing urban and rural, and then schools and households. This is the map of Tanzania. You have Harare with the urban campaign and you have the, well, 
have difficulty seeing that properly. Uh, figures in that are that you will find in the next slide. It's the geographic coverage. It's the number of schools. That's these are project data: number of teachers, learners, uh, neighbors, number of health centers, and so on. All these numbers are illustrated in this table. This is a bit small, but first you see schools and direct beneficiaries. So you see we are dealing with about total 48,000 direct beneficiaries in schools. And then we have direct beneficiaries in households. These are about 22,000. And we have um, direct beneficiaries, communities and schools a total of 68 direct and 129 indirect beneficiary direct and indirect beneficiaries so this is these are the project key figures and these figures will be important when we calculate per unit uh, costs the project costs you see there is a big share of the project costs that are the research component this project had an innovative character so they had to rely on on some research, they have to they had to innovate the approach and to apply it in a very specific way. So these meant a certain amount of costs that were bound to the project. And then we have the implementation costs and we have the local costs. I will not go into all the details. We'll see that later on. Um, so you have this this table here that shows the costs again before, during and after the campaign and what i especially want to show the costs before were quite high because that was the the research and development costs and then during implementation the costs are also high because well it's it's an international uh, organization implementing a project that has high costs but then you see the interesting part is after the campaign to keep the activities Go ongoing, you have a much lower level of expenses that is required. So now this is maybe a little bit wishful thinking that the activities will continue at the same level just by one year uh, campaign that is shown here. But this is the evolution of costs over time. Um, and you will see this will lead to specific indicators. So that was preparation and then implementation and after project implementation. The, it would be wrong to assume that before the hand washing campaign, the people were not washing their hands at all. And that's what Pradeep mentioned, the before after comparison or the with without comparison that we always have to do when we do such analysis. So we had hand washing practices after the campaign minus the hand washing practices before the campaign gives the net behavior change regarding hand washing quality and frequency. So this is the way we have assessed the improvement that was connected to the project in, uh, investment. So changes in behavior. So we had, <clears throat> um, we have used uh, the EAVAG evaluation. That was this, the study by EAVAG, which have assessed the, the um, the adoption, and then we have used also our scale, the quality frequency ladder that we have, I've explained before. And these two elements allowed us to get a pretty good idea of the situation. So this gave the following uh, uh, picture. You have a QF index survey, and this is the percent change. Uh, this is households and and schools, and this is only households, and this is only schools, and we see what is the change in behavior in percent point explained and converted into our ladder from one to five. So this is what we could use as figures to show what was the change uh, in behavior. If we look at the impact on diarrhea, we used some figures that we could obtain from our survey and also some uh, figures that come from the literature. And so they said 60.7% reduction of cases, and this is higher than what we would find in literature. Now, what are the indicators that were used? So we 
as you as I mentioned before, there was quite a high um, amount used for research in this project. So we did one calculation with research costs and one calculation without research costs. So if you do a similar project in another place, you would not have to do all the research again. And that's why we, we chose to show both, uh, both results with and without these research costs. And then we also have an indicator only local costs after the campaign. So we have per beneficiary reached, that's at the level of outputs. And then in terms of net behavior change, that's an outcome. And then impact on health, that would be an impact. And then impact on non-health aspects, that would be an additional impact. So here you have dollars per beneficiary, dollars per behavior change, dollars per case of diarrhea averted, and dollars per, per day of school absenteeism averted. So what can we see? And these are now the results. And as I said, when you have results, then will come the, the stage of interpreting the results because the figures just like this don't tell very much. We see per beneficiary reached, we have, if we can count everything, we have $21 total per person reached. That's what the campaign costs compared to the number of people that were uh, reached in uh, direct beneficiaries. Then if we look at this without the research cost, then it goes down to 11. And if we consider only the local cost, then it's about $2.3. Then if we move to the second one, behavior changed, we have here $60 per behavior change uh, using this quality frequency index. If we exclude the research cost, it's about half, 32. And if we look only at local costs, it's 9.2. If we look at the cases, uh, the costs per cases of diarrhea, we have $29 uh, per case. And then if we exclude the research, it's 15.7. And if we have only local costs, it's 4.4. So obviously we will be able to compare then what does it cost to treat a case of diarrhea and how does how much does it cost to prevent it? So the 4.4 would be the cost of prevention as compared to the cost of, of treatment. And the treatment is not the only thing. If you are sick, you are un unable to work. So there are more benefits that would be uh, still uh, obtained. And then non-health impacts will not go into this now. Uh, and then we did not calculate uh, indicator of sustainability of benefits, of course, we have to assess how sustainable are the results and are we really be, will we really be able to continue or to assume that the, the results will continue even after the uh, termination of the campaign and will the people integrate this in their normal behavior or normal school policies, for instance. So then we come to some calculations to compare groups. Uh, this was not really what we aimed at as a main result, but we still wanted to show some differences uh, looking at caregivers and teachers who has uh, higher QF indexes. And you see there is a significant difference here between the, the teachers and the caregivers. Um, another one shows the difference between rural and urban uh, but again, this is not really what was the most important. This was also to, to show differences between all the different schools. Um, but now we come to interpretation. So what does it mean, all this? Was the campaign successful? Was it efficient? Was it effective? And are the results sustainable? And we were in the lucky situation that after f completing our study, we could go to Zimbabwe again and meet with those people in those uh, schools and communities and present our results. And we had a workshop with them on these issues of uh, efficiency, effectiveness and sustainability. So also to interpret the results, we, we can compare with other studies from other countries. You will see just one or two elements from a study in Burkina Faso that had a similar approach. And then we can compare specific ele elements such as rural versus urban and households versus schools. 
So this discussion, efficiency and effectiveness, and then sustainability. And then you see cost-benefit analysis. We did not do a, a CBA, but we showed how could we do it if we want to go one step further into this uh, direction. So first, the comparison with other studies, the study in Burkina Faso here and the study in uh, the, the campaign in uh, Zimbabwe. So here you compare the number of beneficiaries. You, say, you see uh, 68,000 beneficiaries, and it was about half in Burkina Faso. In terms of total implementation costs, we had about 800,000 Swiss francs here or dollars and 450. So it was also in comparison to the number of people reached, it was a bit comparable. Differences were... Sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt you. We are running a bit uh, over time. So I was wondering if you could wrap up the your presentation over in a few minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think we are not so far from, from the end. Okay, so there were slight differences, but we can see these were comparable. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, the question is, uh, is it possible to do a cost-benefit analysis? It's difficult to monetize the results, and there are many uncertainties in the reliability of the data. There is a, a big gap between self-reported and observed behavior, and this is a major element. Uh, the people, they tend to, to tell you, yes, yes, I do wash my hands always and very well, but when you observe it, the, the res result is quite different. So what do you... Consider when you do the calculation, you may do it with different options. Um, so this is what a CBA would look like. Uh, you would have the total investment. That, that would be, for instance, the research part of the project. And then you have the costs during year one with the donor and then for the subsequent years with just the local costs. And you would, if you can quantify the benefits like reduced cases of diarrhea and so on, you could uh, compute here all the benefits and you could, in, in theory, you could calculate the cash flow generated by the project. But as I said, this is something we did not do in this project. Now, this slide, I think it's quite important to show because it's showing the quality of data and we have to be aware of this when we do any kind of cost-benefit analysis. So when you look at uh, this slide, you have high, medium and low. High means high quality data. This is medium quality data. And in the red part, you have low quality data. Looking at what we have used in this study, we had SDC costs. This is pretty sure. You, you take it from reports, it's easy to get and it's reliable. Local costs, a little bit less, but still the people can tell you what it costs. Government costs, you may get a pretty good idea. The number of people reached and trained, this is at the level of outputs, so this is also easy to capture. And indirect beneficiaries, you can count how many and the way you, depending on how you define them, they are also pretty easy to get. When it comes to behavior change, this is already more difficult. Uh, think of the, the, the um, difference between self-reported and observed, which I just explained before. And school absenteeism is also not so easy to capture and spe specifically to put in relation with the, the campaign. And then when it, case, it comes to number of cases of diarrhea averted, the numbers can be obtained, but it's quite difficult. And when it comes to economic value of time saved or policy interventions or costs of diarrhea, then you are on the unsafe side of data. So the more you go to the right, the less you should rely too much on the data and make too, too strong conclusions. So that's what we call the safe zone for economic modeling, the risky zone and the dangerous zone, zone for economic modeling. So we have to think of this when we do analysis. And if you do a CBA, you would need data from the right side, whereas if you do a CEA, you remain more on the left and central side of this slide. So some recommendations. Well, there is the issue of attribution. And as I know that you will have access to this slide, to this presentation, I will not go into these points. Then we have questions related to data availability and quality. And then lessons learned and recommendations. 
it's important to involve local st stakeholders, not just to do a study and tell them this is the study, but to have an involvement of the stakeholders. Um, we have to consider that each time you have to develop a new methodology, as we had to do it here for the CEA of this, of this project, it takes a lot of time of reflection, and this is, a, this is research. It's not just applying a method, so this takes time. Um, designing and testing the tools should not be too much in a hurry. We had to hurry up when we did it, and this had some negative consequences later on. Um, we know it's difficult to combine data from different sources. I mentioned the AAVAC study and our own uh, data, and it was difficult to combine them. Scientific research implies constraints. Then attribution of benefits is always an issue. Uh, how much of the benefits can be attributed to the campaign? The data quality remains an issue. That's referring to the earlier slide. And the results of the study are a useful reference for SDC and for the handwashing stakeholders in Zimbabwe. Nevertheless, uh, it's quite a positive result that we have this detailed analysis and that's available. And the process of analyzing the costs effectiveness uh, of such a campaign is equally important as the result. So the process was really something that we could involve the beneficiaries in, and that was very useful. So I will just show you a few slides that were the outcome of the workshops we had in Zimbabwe with the local stakeholders. So they were quite active and they discussed about the four aspects of uh, uh, whether it was successful or not, and uh, what were uh, uh, the main elements, and then was it efficient, was it effective, and was it is it sustainable? So this was the view of the local stakeholders. So I think this was my last slide. Thank you very Thank much you. for your patience. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much, Dominique, for this uh, really good and clear presentation. Uh, we are running a little bit over time, actually, so I would like to ask for permission to extend the webinar uh, by 15 minutes because a lot of questions have come in. Um, and if that's okay with you and Pradeep, we can uh, we can go through those uh, through those questions now that uh, the participants have asked. Uh, but thank you very much for the um, for the the uh, the presentation you gave. Um, and and the first question that came is from uh, Marianne, who works in for Helvetas in Tajikistan. And she, this is a question for Pradeep. Um, she asks, many thanks for the interesting presentation. We do cost-benefit analysis of a project before starting. Ex ante, it's based on many assumptions. And when we implement the project, we have the information on whether the assumptions are correct. So her question is, should we update the cost-benefit analysis based on the reality and on the updated information, or should we just do repeat the assumption of the ex-ante cost-benefit analysis? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, yes, it's very clear that um, in this case, before a project, you are not sure of uh, many of the outcomes. You have assumptions. And uh, during the monitoring, it is a good practice uh, to then review um, at a few intervals uh, if your assumptions and uh, what you had foreseen still holds and update your analysis. Uh, this is most useful. And at the end of the project, you can really, um, with much more confidence, do an ex post analysis with um, actual uh, figures of what you have achieved and uh, what the costs were. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, I, can I add something? Yeah. Please, yeah, go ahead. I'm just coming back from uh, a mission in uh, in Myanmar where we also did cost-benefit analysis and it was also ex-ante and the people had exactly the same question. And we really encouraged them to combine or to connect the CBA with the monitoring system. And that's that should be what, what would help the project to use the CBA as a tool for steering, for monitoring the project. And then you will collect the data that are needed for the CBA and then you can update it from time to time. And if it's well done, then at the end of the project, if you have regularly updated it, you already have the ex post CBA. That's the corrected with all the corrections, all the right parameters as compared to the assumptions that you had at the beginning. 
Great, thank you um, for this this example. Um, there's another question that came in from uh, Pierre Yves, and he asks, uh, "How would you advise? How would you deal with risks which are often linked with a particular context?" And by risks, he means uh, risks which may go against the implementation of the results of a project and which have not been taken into account during project design. Uh, so I would like to ask this question to Dominique first. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Pierre-Yves. <laughs> um, when you have a CBA model and you have your your um, cash flow, annual cash flow, and uh, all the projected benefits and costs, then you can simulate, and that relates to the, the sensitivity analysis that Pradeep has mentioned, you can simulate a very bad year. So you, you say after year three, you have a year where you get only one third of the yield uh, if you are in an agricultural project. So you, you can simulate such risks by having a very bad year or two bad years in sequence. So this could be a way in the CBA to, sim to simulate um, a risks or an unexpected event. But I don't know if this is what the kind of answers that you expected. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it, I would have answered similarly. And uh, there are some um, of your uh, costs or elements of benefits, which you know are, uh, there are risks. So when you do this sensitivity analysis, uh, look in the more risky part of your project and say, okay, if my assumption of these kind of yields or whatever is not uh, happening, uh, if there are instead of one bad year out of five, uh, three bad years of out of five, would it still be worth going ahead with this project and see how it looks like? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, if if Pierre, if you want to qualify a little bit, what if this is what you 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 were expecting as a response, feel free to do so in the in the chat box as well. Uh, the next question is from Cesarina. Uh, Quintana, and she asks uh, how you would consider the leverage of public funds in an economic analysis. Uh, so this question I would ask to Pradeep to start with. Um, um, I'm afraid I'm not 100% sure how to understand the question. So... I, I think she means in the costs uh, part of the uh, economic analysis. How would you consider public funds as part of the costs. This is what I, how ah, I understood okay. it. Okay, well, if you do an economic analysis, you really need to take all the uh, all the costs uh, because there might be some costs which are borne by SDC, but the government or other stakeholders would also be incurring maybe a certain costs in, in, in the project. So these have to be taken into account. Let's say if we are the SDC project is retraining or improving uh, the capacities of uh, certain, uh, let's say, teachers. Uh, that's fine. Uh, that's the incremental cost. But you might also want to consider the whole costs uh, which have been incurred in, um, let's say, an education project and not only uh, the incremental costs due to the project. And then you would maybe have to consider the salaries of the of the teachers as well. So it depends a bit on what kind of analysis, which point of view are you looking at? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Marianne also, um, who asks... Uh, and I think this was in in one in the, in the second presentation from Dominique, perhaps, um, that the time period of a cost benefit analysis usually is six to ten years. And could you please say what is the rule to define how many years the cost benefit analysis of a particular project should be done? And I will ask Dominique to start with. Okay. Yes, uh, this is a good question, and. Uh, well, this is a, a rule of thumb, and it's six, six to ten years. Now, let's take an example where six to ten years will not be sufficient. Imagine the project you, we talk about is is a production of some fruit, the, and the trees take five years before they bear some fruit. So this project will start, and then for five years, you have only costs to 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 care for the trees, to do the management, but there is no benefit, only costs. 
And only after five years, you will have the first fruit that you can collect and the, the production starts really become bigger after six to 10 years. So then maybe 10 years would be too short. So that's an example where you really have to extend a little bit the, the period for the analysis. In other projects, the benefits will come immediately. If you, if you think of, uh, I don't know, milk production, you buy a cow and then you can start milking, assuming you do it properly. I mean, the, there is no big delay between the start of the project and the first benefits that you can start selling. So these, these considerations are to be considered. What is the project all about? Thank you. Um, the next question actually is, I'm, I'm going to take two questions which are sort of linked to the questions of Florian and Cesarina. Um, so Florian says, uh, consideration on cost-benefit analysis and cost-effectiveness analysis are compulsory in SDC's project cycle uh, for a while. And what is the experience of the SDC Quality Assurance uh, Department with this? Are SDC staff and consultants able to deliver the expected analysis and or considerations? Is it meaningful? Has it led to better cost-effectiveness? And Cesarina asks, what do you think of this, this cost benefits, cost effectiveness analysis uh, as, in, as an international cooperation as an agency, has it had an impact? Um, so I think this question is for you, Pradeep, if you could, uh, if you could say a few words on that. Yes, uh, Florian, you're right in saying that uh, it has been considered as compulsory for a long time. Um, but uh, we are still at a very low uh, rates of um, implementation of um, any economic or financial analysis. It's, I think, uh, below 10% at the moment. And uh, so what we have been thinking is uh, we know it is quite demanding. And um, as we have heard from Dominique's experience, uh, uh, the case of Zimbabwe, it, it, it is not just a, an easy thing. And uh, we have been thinking of maybe um, adjusting a bit our guidelines. We would have to ask our directorate if do, they would agree that at least some elements of uh, reflection would be really considered as uh, compulsory and um, if possible, conduct a full cost effectiveness or a full cost benefit analysis to increase uh, the awareness and the thinking around costs and benefits. Uh, that would be something that we uh, are considering um, for our directorates to decide upon uh, because we realize we are not able to go um, at and, and increase the rates of uh, application of, of these. And this is not only at SDC, uh, other agencies face uh, similar issues because these types of analysis are quite demanding. Um, and especially for uh, cases where you are not, uh, it's not easy to monetize uh, the benefits. Um, in terms of, I think, importance, and then now that development aid is more and more under scrutiny, also by our parliamentarians, what happened just two months ago, our colleagues here from Nepal were called because there were some parliamentarians in Switzerland saying, um, I think it was a vocational training project and saying, OK, we have uh, looked at your project and um, looked at the costs and divided by the number of trainees and uh, we come to a absolutely uh, very high cost per number of, of student trained. And uh, this shows that SDC is doing a very poor job uh, in terms of uh, cost um, being cost effective. Um, so these are real threats and uh, questions which are being asked by uh, people who are criticizing our work. So we need to also be able to give answers. In this case, uh, these parliamentarians did a very quick and dirty job. Um, and we need to be able to have the arguments to reply that their analysis was insufficient. It has not taken into account many more factors uh, because the 
vocational training is not just for one batch of students, but it continues over several years. And these students afterwards will be able to get uh, better employment, better jobs and higher income through the vocational training program. And if uh, this project had done such an analysis, we would have been in a position to give much better answers to these uh, parliamentarians questioning our work. Mm, thank you for this uh, answer. Um, yeah, so basically it's also helpful for SDC's accountability um, to its uh, to different stakeholders. Um, yeah, so... I'd, like to, I'd just like to add something. Yeah, go ahead. This. Go ahead, Demi. I mean, when I arrived in Myanmar uh, 10 days ago, it was a Helvetas project and they told me, oh, you, we hire you for a CBA because we have to. And I said, please, I would not like to do a CBA because you have to do it because SDC asks you for it. Take it as an asset for your project. It will be a very valuable tool for you. And if you do it right and you do not consider it as a constraint, but as, an, as a chance to do this, then you will have a completely different view on this and you will use it yourselves over time. And when you have the model, the CBA model, on your Excel and you can start modifying some parameters and see what happens if then you see the, the usefulness of it and the beauty of the tool. So I think we should also give a positive image of the CBA, not just a constraint by SDC. Exactly. I would like to reinforce what Dominic is saying. And as he also said during his presentation, it's not just uh, the calculation and the final figure. It is the process of discussing amongst the stakeholders and improving uh, the, the design um, of the project through this process, which is important because there you can pinpoint on where are the high costs, where are the uh, highest benefits, how to improve this ratio, what is making really a difference um, in the lives of the people. And that's also a beauty in looking at cost benefit. You look at really the benefits until the, the, the level of the beneficiaries because you do not, it's not useful to just stay at the level we have been able to influence uh, two policies or two laws in the in the constitution or whatever uh, you need to really go down and see what has this changed in the lives of the beneficiaries and during this whole process then you are also improving uh, your results your impact of, of your project by by discussing this with the with the stakeholders Thank you both uh, for this uh, this sort of um, very uh, uh, positive discourse and, and the impact of what, what how it can help really the project also to to do this sort of uh, analysis. And uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to address the last question, which is a sort of a methodology question from Monica uh, to Dominique about the the Zimbabwe uh, study, and she asks. Uh, does the calculation of the net behavior change include the evolution of hand washing and other indicators in a control group? If you could quickly respond, Dominique. Dominique, if you can unmute your microphone, then you will be able to, be able to hear you. <laughs> um, well, we, we did it. I mean, the hand washing, it was not so easy to do. Uh, we, we did not have much time for data collection. So we had to do the, the assessment through the teachers. So the teachers assessed the behavior change of their school children. So that was an indirect measure. Um, and they compared this to what it was before. So there was no control group as such, but they just said before the campaign, it was different and the improvement was by so and so much. Now, the positive thing, I mean, it's it's always better to do a with-without comparison than to do a before-after because there is a time lag between before and after and the, the situation may have changed. But since the campaign was short, the before-after comparison is only one year uh, difference. So the, it's not that the, the school children were small and then they are, you know, they're grown up in the meantime. No, it's just one year, the time lag. So this is okay to compare before after and we had no better option for that. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, this question concludes the question and answer session of this uh, webinar. And before we wrap up, I just wanted to point to the two resources which Pradeep and Dominique mentioned, uh, the SDC How-To Note and the online course on cost-benefit analysis. If you're interested and if this webinar has awakened your interest in cost-benefit analysis, please check out the uh, Réseau Web share, uh, web share website uh, where all these resources are and we will also upload the recording of this webinar and the presentations that Pradeep and Dominique uh, gave. Just a quick reminder as well that we have some more webinars coming up uh, later this year. The next one will be next month in June on integrated water resources management. We will circulate it to the réseau and you can feel free to um, sign up if you'd like to participate. I would like now to thank our two uh, presenters, Dominique Gena and Pradeep Itty, for two excellent presentations and for staying longer to answer all the questions that we had. I'd also like to thank all the participants for being patient and, and staying a little bit longer. It was a really interesting webinar and well facilitated as well by Martin Lang and Ege Akiol in the background. Thank you all and I hope to see you again soon online. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat>